We make ourselves so miserable trying to be happy. But Jesus came to bring men happiness, to, make, to bring meaning to life. But the key to his kind of happiness would be to follow the standards of living and the standards of thinking that he would lay down. A new kind of life, which is counter to everything that the world knows and understands and practices. That is contrary to everything that you and I would think is common sense, everything that we think makes sense. But the result of this kind of transformation you see, Jesus says is this. Jesus says, if you will do, if you will become what I'm telling you to become, then the result is happiness. True happiness, lasting happiness, not the kind of happiness that is relying upon the things that go on in our world. It's not produced by circumstances. It doesn't depend on uh, whether you have your bills paid or how nice your clothes are or, or any of those things. You see. Because this kind of happiness that Jesus offers is not produced externally, therefore it is a state of being, of well-being, that cannot be touched by external circumstances. It doesn't matter what happens to you. Would you like that kind of happiness? Can you imagine if we actually had that kind of happiness? I mean, I know we say that. I know we kind of talk about that. But what if we actually had it? If we actually possessed it? I mean, really. In the sense of, you know, it, it just really doesn't much matter what happens to me today. I'm happy. I'm full of joy, full of peace. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't, wouldn't that just be a transformation? Jesus is saying that if you live by these standards, you will be happy. And he will go on to tell us what they are, and we'll get into the first one today. But every one of the standards that he lays down begin with the word blessed. The word blessed can be translated happy, joyful, truly joyful. So Jesus comes offering a new standard of living that has little to do with external behavior, but starts with the thinking. See, most people when they come in, and most people when they tell us, hey, you know what, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to change things in your life. Here's what they do. They say, okay, I want you to get up in the morning and I want you to do this, and then you do that, and then you go to play, uh, step C and then step D, and then if you do these seven things and whatever and yada yada, then, then your life will, will work better, you see. But Jesus doesn't do that, oddly enough. What Jesus says is, is hey, you know what, let, let, let's forget about what you're doing, okay, for, for a moment. I'm not going to give you the ten keys to whatever. What he says is, look, let's forget about externals. Let's talk about something else. Let, let, let's switch gears. Let's switch the subject. Let's talk about what's inside you. Let's talk about what's in your heart. I'm not going to talk about what you do. I want to talk about who you are. That's Jesus. And as he begins to speak about who we are, he tells us some things. Some things that challenge our thinking. But you see, it all starts with, the scripture says, as a man thinks within himself, so is he. So it starts from the inside. And here's what Jesus says. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does the word blessed mean? The word blessed simply means to be happy regardless of circumstances. The word blessed means to be happy regardless of circumstances. The multitude you see was there listening. Huge crowd. But only his disciples... Only his disciples could begin to comprehend the meaning of what Jesus was saying, the meaning of what Jesus was teaching. You know, for those of us who are his disciples, for those of us who, who, who claim his name, who follow him, who are Christians, it's odd that in 
many ways we've lost our distinctiveness from the world. You see, God wants us to live differently than the world, to think differently. And if we do, he says, we'll be blessed. But we often don't do it. Either because we don't believe Jesus, or because we think it's too hard. Eh, the price is too much. I'm sure he's right, but you know what, I just, I just really don't want to go through that. But there won't be any difference between us and the world on the outside until there's a difference between us and the world on the inside. And that, my friends, is what Jesus is speaking about. You see, some of us try to cleanse the outside, don't we? We try to change the outside. We approach religion, we approach Jesus, we approach uh, trying to be a disciple by saying, okay, well, what, what are the five things I really need to improve on? Okay, you know, I can pray more, I can do this. And by the way, those things are good. I'm not saying those are bad things. But that's how we try to approach Christianity, you see. But here's what Jesus is saying by this whole poor and spirit thing. And this is, by the way, why he begins with it. What he's saying by this whole poor and spirit thing is, is, is look, guys, forget it, just quit. Okay, quit trying to change the outside until you grasp that there must be a fundamental change on the inside. True outward change can only come from a change of heart. There was a story of a boy, a little boy who, who, who would escape his, his uh, uh, upstairs bedroom after being punished. He would crawl out of his window and down an old fruit tree to the ground. One day his father told him that he was going to chop down the tree because it hadn't borne any fruit for years. And so that evening, the boy and his friend got together and they bought a bushel of apples and they hung them on the tree. Hung those things right on the tree, right on the barren branches. And the next morning, the man got up. He couldn't believe his eyes. The tree was full of fruit. He said, honey, come out here. You've got to see this thing. He says, honey, it's, it's full. It's full of fruit. This thing hasn't borne any fruit in years, and now it's covered with apples. And the most amazing thing about this is that it's a pear tree. <laughs> You see, but that's what it looks like, folks. That's how absurd, that's how ridiculous it looks when you and I try to change the outside without first changing the inside. And so Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. See, that's an inside thing. That's an inside job. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What is Jesus really saying? What does this mean? Why, why does Jesus begin first with the idea of being poor in spirit? Why, why does he start there? Couldn't he start at a better spot? Couldn't he start with something more encouraging? Here's why. Jesus begins with this. And Jesus begins his sermon with being poor in spirit because it is essential for anyone seeking eternal life. Jesus begins his sermon with being poor in spirit because it is essential for anyone seeking eternal life. You can't get one step closer to God until you're poor in spirit. <laughs> you see, the door to the kingdom is low, and only those can enter who crawl. Jesus says here that there are heights that you will have to climb as a Christian. There are standards that you must attain, but you are incapable of finding them. You are incapable of attaining them. And the sooner you realize this, the sooner you're on your way to attaining it. You 
can't be filled, Jesus says, until you are empty. Have you ever noticed how many books there are out there in the Christian bookstore about being filled with this and full of that and filled with that and filled with this? Isn't it interesting why there are no books about how to be empty? Isn't it interesting how there are no books about how to empty yourself? I mean, I haven't seen them. But you see, this is what Jesus is saying. I don't know what book that's been written on what Jesus is saying, at least not by that title. It wouldn't be very popular if it was published, would it? I don't know how many people would buy it. Ten ways to be poor in spirit. <laughs> awesome. All right, I'm going to run out and get that. You see, but Jesus, Jesus has a different take on things. Modern Christianity knows a little of this, I'm afraid. Certainly in the United States. We really don't know what this is. The only way into God's kingdom is to confess that you don't know the way. And then he shows you. You have to come with a sense of helplessness, a sense of desperation. But we as a church often, we, we, we kind of think we've got it all together. Okay, I know Christ, I, you know, I got it all, we're good. And see, that's why you wrote to the church at Laodicea. You know, you, 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 you really think you're rich. You got it all together. I tell you, you are poor. You're wretched, you're blind, you're miserable. You're, you're poor, but you think you're rich. Okay? It's better to be poor in spirit. So what does poor in spirit mean? What does poor in spirit mean? Here's what it doesn't mean. Let me clear it up for you. Here's what it absolutely does not mean. It doesn't mean how much is in your bank account. It's not what it means to be poor in spirit. At least not here. Not in this section. It's, it's not about how wealthy you are or how poor you are or whether or not you have nothing or have everything. That's not what it's about. It's not talking about material wealth or material poverty. How do I know this? I know this too for two reasons, because that's not the Greek word, you, word used. But then secondly, if that were the reason, if that were the case, if it was talking about material possessions, then shouldn't we as Christians all stop giving to the poor? We want them to be blessed, don't we? See, if it was saying that, then we couldn't give. It's not saying that. We ought to give to the poor. And the reason is because this is not talking about material possessions. Poor in spirit is talking about something completely different. Different. There is a word in the New Testament, is the word panes. It's a Greek word, and it's used to talk about someone who is poor in the sense that they, every single day, they've got to go and go out and work hard to make a living. They're poor, you see. In other words, they're not independently wealthy. They're not rich. So they have to go out, and every day they have to scratch out a living. And they're making it, don't get me wrong, but they're barely making it, you know, they're just kind of, hey. Anyway, okay, so we're working every day, right? All of us. And we're, we're kind of scratching out this living. That's panes. That's a different Greek word. Here's the Greek word that Jesus uses. He uses the word tokas. Tokas when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the tokas in spirit. What is, what is the difference between that and the other one? Here's what tokas means. The root word of this means to crouch like this to crouch your ear that's told us why are you crouching here's why you're crouching you're crouching because you're so poor that you are unable to work you're unable to to, to provide for yourself in any way, and so you crouch and you beg. Could, could I have a dollar? Could I have some food? That's tokenness. Don't forget. 
forgive. Because that is exactly what Jesus means when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So poor that there is nothing you could ever, ever, ever do to provide for yourself. Spiritual. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Folks, this isn't just poor, this is begging poor. Begging poor. You've got to rely on the charity of others. You have no resources. You're totally deprived, totally dependent. You're beggar poor. And folks, I tell you the truth, until you and I understand, until you and I see ourselves spiritually as beggars, you'll never come to Christ. Being poor in spirit means realizing your spiritual bankruptcy. Being poor in spirit means realizing your spiritual bankruptcy. We have no sense of self-sufficiency. This is the exact opposite of Luke chapter 18. I'd like you to turn with me there, if you will. Turn with me to Luke chapter 18 and look at verse 9. Luke 18, 9 says this. So he told a parable of someone who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like this other man. I am not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a tax collector like this man. Lord, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of everything I get. tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. Tokos! Tokos! He's a beggar. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me. Be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted, blessed, and poor in spirit. You see, being poor in spirit is the opposite of pride and self-sufficiency. Being poor in spirit is the opposite of pride and self-sufficiency. May I ask you, have you ever cringed in a corner? Cried out to God for mercy out of absolute desperation? You've tried it all, you've done it all, you, you've been through all the stuff, and, and over and over again you fail, and finally you just get to the point you say, Lord, I'm done. I need you. There is nothing I bring to the table. I don't bring anything. See, most of us think the Lord does most of it, you know, but then we can bring this and this and that to him. After all, right? We can, we can, I can, hey, here's what I got. But the fact is, to this table, to this spiritual table, we bring nothing. In fact, we bring less than nothing. We bring poverty. We bring a debt so large, it can't be paid. Except by the blood of Christ. You see, the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount was to show them that they could never live out this standard. It was one of the purposes. They, 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 you, you can't get it. I don't care how long you've been trying, I don't care how good you are, you, you, you're not going to attain it. But here's the problem. You can't preach this message. You 
can't preach this message to an unregenerate person and expect him to live it. Because you've got to have a new nature which begins with being poor in spirit. So what's the result then? What's the result of us getting to the point where we understand our depravity and we, we are poor in spirit? We grovel, we toke us, we beg. And we say, Lord, just, I need you. Here's the result. Poverty of spirit results in receiving the kingdom of heaven. Poverty of spirit results in receiving the kingdom of heaven. The result is that heaven is yours. And you say, well, wait, wait a minute. It doesn't really feel like heaven is mine. I mean, <laughs> my life's pretty rough right now. Oddly enough, this verb is present tense. It doesn't say heaven will be yours. It doesn't say the kingdom of heaven will be yours. It says it is yours. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. It's now. Yes, I understand. It will be fully realized later when Christ returns. But you are in it now. Philippians 2 says we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's present tense, folks. We are, not we will be, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We have the grace of the kingdom now, and we will receive the glory of the kingdom then. But we do have its grace now. So receiving the kingdom of heaven means God fills your every need. God fills our every need and makes us rich. Receiving the kingdom of heaven means God fills our every need and makes us rich. So about this time, you may be thinking, okay, I guess maybe I thought I was poor in spirit. Maybe I'm not. So here's my question. How, if I really want to, how do I become poor in spirit? How do I become poor in spirit? Well, I tell you how it's not done. It's not by monasticism or asceticism. It's not by selling everything you own and going up on a mountaintop and living in a monastery. That's not going to make you poor in spirit. It, it might make you prouder, but it won't make you poor in spirit. It's not necessarily about denying yourself physical things, about beating yourself, cutting off parts of your body. This is, you see, an effort to arrive at this on your own, and it's impossible. Here's what poor in spirit. Here's how you can become poor in spirit. We become poor in spirit first by seeking God. By seeking God and reading his word. We become poor in spirit by seeking God and reading his word. Number two. We become poor in spirit by killing our pride and starving our flesh. We become poor in spirit by killing our pride and starving our flesh. Now, I don't mean the physical flesh. I don't mean you starve yourself by not eating necessarily. What I mean is that you starve your sinful nature. You don't feed its lusts. And then third, you become poor in spirit. And here's the kicker. By asking Christ to change you. By asking Christ to change you. Why? Because beggars are always begging. And that's what we have to be. They're always asking. They're always seeking. They're always knocking. They're always begging. And folks, you and I have to be spiritual beggars. How will I know if I'm poor in spirit? What if, I, what if I do these things for a while and I, I ask Christ to do this? And How will I know? How will I know if I've arrived? We can know we're poor in spirit if, if we lose our sense of self. Folks, when you begin losing your sense of self, losing your focus on it's all about me, and what makes me happy, what makes me tick, what I want to do with my life, how I can be fulfilled, you see. Once we start losing that, then we're well on our way to 
living or in spirit. Psalm 131, 2 says, My soul is like a weaned child. A weaned child. So one who is poor in spirit loses a sense of self. You now think about God and about others. You know, my child that isn't weaned yet, that's eight months old now, she doesn't think about others. Okay? I guarantee you that. Okay? Love her to death. She doesn't think about others. Not a bit. Okay? She's not even weaned yet. But when we get older, when we grow up, when we mature, you see, we start thinking about other people. Lose our sense of self. Next. We can know we are poor in spirit when we are lost in the wonder of Christ. When we are lost in the wonder of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled faces behold the glory of the Lord and are thus being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We are lost in the wonder of Christ and who he is. Third, we can know we are poor in spirit when we stop complaining. When we stop complaining. Why? Because you see, the only people that complain are the people that think they got it bad and they deserve better. You see, if you didn't think you deserved better, you wouldn't be complaining, would you? You only complain when you think you really deserve better. Then it's worth complaining. But you see, when you understand who you are and that you deserve nothing, how can you complain? Or in spirit. Next. You can know you're poor in spirit when you value others highly. When you value all others highly. When you see only the excellencies of others and only your own weakness. You won't be critical. You won't be judgmental. You won't be picking apart all the problems you see with the other guy next to you. Philippians 2, 3 says, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Which others? What others? Others. You mean all others? Uh -huh. All others. More significant than yourself. When you get to that point, see, if you consider someone more significant than yourself, you're not going to criticize them. Five, you can know you are poor in spirit when you spend much time in prayer. Why? Because beggars are always begging. Because beggars are always begging. Always reaching out to the Lord. Ever in need of Him. Always aware of the fact that they are nothing without Him. And that everything comes from him. Spend much time in prayer. Next, number six. You can know that you are poor in spirit when you take Christ on his terms. On his terms rather than your own. When you take Christ on his terms. You see, a proud sinner stands and demands Christ and his pleasure. Christ and his own will. Christ and the things that he'd like to do. The poor in spirit, you see, will give up anything just to gain Christ. But the problem is, until you understand how poor you truly are, they really don't need Christ all that much. I mean, you know, he's, a, he's a good addition. I, I like this guy. He's my buddy. He made Christ be in him. But it's not like that. You see, when you understand your poor in spirit, you understand that no matter what Christ asks of you, no matter what he wants, no matter what the price is, no matter what he says, 
you're going to do it. Oh, it may cost you all of the comforts that you know. It may cost you everything you hold dear, everything you're familiar with, everything that's really cozy and cushy and nice in your life. It may just blow that out of the water. But see, my question to you is, will you take Christ on his terms? Or will you insist on taking him only on your own? Only if he fits your agenda. The poor in spirit will give up anything to gain Christ. Because a besieged castle, folks, will surrender on any terms. You get that? A besieged castle knows it has no chance of victory, no chance of recovery. It's either death or you surrender. What are the terms? It doesn't matter what the terms are. You tell me. I surrender. I surrender before I hear the terms. You get that? I surrender before I hear the terms. Work whatever you want me to do. That's what I'll do. Take Christ on his terms. And seven, lastly, you can know that you're poor in spirit when you are constantly thankful. When you're constantly thankful. I have met some people, very few, <laughs> I can count them on less than one hand, but I have met some people that I can truly say, they're just thankful. I mean, their life can just be a train wreck, physically. A train wreck, financially, and they're thankful. And on one hand, I admire them. On the other hand, I like, I hate this guy. Really? I mean, he makes me look bad. He did this guy. Can't you, can't you tell me anything's wrong? Can't you ever complain about him? Mean, didn't you stub your big toe or something? I mean, come on. Really? Can we just, let's just be honest here, okay? No, no, no. They're always saying, oh, no, life is good. No, really, it's good. I, I'm blessed. <laughs> Pastor Gus, he's on. How are you doing? I'm blessed. <laughs> right? You love this guy. Right? Every time you ask him, how you doing? I'm there. All right. <laughs> See, that's great. That's great because we are blessed. We're constantly thankful. First Timothy 1.14 says the grace of our Lord. Check this out. This, this, this is Paul's take on life, okay? You, you get this guy, right? He's in prison, right? He's been beaten. And, and, and he's gone hungry, and, and he's been shipwrecked, and I mean, you, you know, Paul, right? The, the guy's messed up, okay? Believe me, his life is not one you look to and say, yeah, I want to be like that guy. Uh -uh. His life is messed up, and here's what he says. 1 Timothy 1.14, the grace, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Paul, oh, Paul, oh, man. Wait a minute. Aren't you, aren't, isn't your life pretty hard? Hey, hey, listen, guys. The grace of the Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Wow. Wow. How are you doing on your poor and spirit? I'm afraid I'm not going to do well. We need to ask God to change us. We need to ask Him to make us poor in spirit so that we can have the kingdom of heaven and we can be blessed. Would you pray with me? Father, as we together learn from Jesus this morning, we're, uh, we're taken aback by the things that he says. Father, it catches us off guard. We, 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 we thought we kind of had it halfway together, Lord. And he kind of blew that up in our face. Lord, help us to understand what he wants from us. 
Help us to understand what it means to be truly poor in spirit. Father, help us to come to you knowing that we're poor, knowing that we're beggar poor. And we don't bring anything to the table, Lord. Father, it's all through you. It's all because you sent your Son, Father. We know that the only way we have any, any, any hope of heaven is because you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die. You offered his broken body as a sacrifice. His blood washes away our sins. Father, humble us and remind us of that. Lord, make us poor in spirit. In Jesus' name.